Okay, thank you. Thank you for accepting my presentation in your seminar. Okay, my talk is about the neurophasy kinematic finite fault inversion. That is a novel kinematic finite fault inversion that we developed during my PhD. And uh, we present, we introduced this method here and briefly present its application to real data that's recorded during the 2016 Amatrice earthquake. And the double earthquakes occurred during 2019 rich first sequence. Okay, let's go away. Okay, um, the kinematic finite fault inversion aims at resolving the rupture function. The rupture function is a dynamic excitation of the fault plane, a dynamic ex excitation of the cr earth crust that convolves with the green function of the medium and uh, by using the convolution integral of the representation theorem, it will uh, converse to the ground motion. And uh, it's provided that we have a elastic solid and the convolution form is uh, uh, the form that is obtained from the elasticity of the problem. By an inverse problem, uh, we are aiming at finding the source function. The source function, uh, which is represented by steep rates on the fault plane, is obtained by deconvolving the observation on the ground surface and a two-dimensional in inversion on the fault plane to see how this rupture evolves throughout the fault. And um, we are solving this problem in this uh, method. One problem that we have here is that the, our problem is substantially underdetermined. Uh, we have low number of observations comparing to the amount of parameters that we need to solve. And um, you see here to perfectly achieve the, the, the complexities of the rupture, we need to find all of this uh, sleep rate function on a dense a number of grid points on the fault plane. And uh, we are trying to decrease the number of parameters that describe this uh, complex slip rate functions. Uh, the Norofazi method aims at reducing the number of these parameters. Well, the problem can be easily formulated in the frequency domain. By taking the Fourier transform, uh, we can uh, transfer the time domain uh, sleep rates into the frequency domain. Uh, by, by frequency domain formulation, we um, alter the, the problem that is uh, formulated in a, in, with a high number of parameters in a high dimensional spatiotemporal domain to a specific problems within each frequency that converts the slip rate within each frequency to the observation at that frequency on the ground surface. And uh, what remains here is an integral over the fault plane. Uh, the convolution is no longer exist. And uh, the source function within each frequency is integrated with the, Gauss, with the uh, Green's function that, and obtains us the ground shaking data. For example, at uh, zero hertz, the static dislocation uh, could be easily converted by uh, taking the zero hertz green functions and obtain only the zero hertz uh, component of the ground motion. That is the static deformation of the ground surface. Um, this, this formula comes from the type of forward formulation we have. And, uh, we do not have any physical constraint between uh, different frequencies. There is only a kinematic constraint that comes from the representation of the world. But uh, still, we have lots of parameters here. Uh, when we are using the uh, frequency domain formulation, we uh, still have lots of parameters to be found on the fault plane. And we are trying, by using the Norfazi function approximation, to reduce this number of parameters. 
The Norfuzzy function approximation is depicted here in this figure. Uh, in Norfuzzy approximation, we no longer have decreased basis functions that are uh, making soft faults for us. Here, this idea of approximation is simply presented. The basis functions are found by these fuzzy domains. They are not creased domains. They can intervene each other. They can, they can cover each other. And uh, they can uh, approximate the whole behavior of a function by these fuzzy sub-elements. I'm not going into details here, but uh, Bart Kosko showed that uh, this type of function approximations are general approximators. We can approximate any kind of function with any, kind, with any number of input variables uh, to approximate a target function. There are many types of fuzzy function approximation approaches, but here we are using ANFIS. ANFIS is a method that combines um, the neural networks with the fuzzy approximation procedure. Um, this procedure was presented originally by Jang in 1994. And um, here, a simple uh, usage of AMPHIS is presented. Um, in the first layer of this neural network, we are uh, discretizing the domain of a function. Consider we are trying to approximate this green line function I presented here. Uh, we are trying to find uh, the best parameters of network that approximates this target function for us. Uh, in the first layer, we are discretizing the whole domain of the problem using the fuzzy membership functions. These fuzzy membership functions working as a discretizing element for us, something like the soft faults we have in the, north, in the kinematic finite fault inversion. Over this uh, basis functions, the base functions of the approximation are built. And by adding weights to the base functions and summing up them together, uh, which is simply with algebraic formulation is presented here, uh, we can approximate the target function. What the network do is the training. And the training is the procedure uh, that finds the best parameters of the network. Uh, the parameters are the, param the, the parameters of these Gaussian functions, the, the middle parameter and the width parameter, and uh, the amplitude of the basis functions. Uh, together, they can approximate the target function for us. The training procedure we use here is the hybrid learning method. The hybrid learning is simply using uh, a two-step uh, training procedure. At the first step, uh, the constants, the weights of the basis functions are found. And in the second step, by using a steepest descent method that is called back propagation in the um, literature of neural networks, we are optimizing the parameters of the Gaussian functions, the membership functions. After some uh, trials, after some training epochs, uh, we are arriving at a stationary point. You can see here that uh, after some few steps, um, the, the target function arrives at a stationary point and the membership functions no longer uh, change anymore. They are uh, quiet, becomes stable. This type of approximations are usually called adaptive approximation. They adapt to the target function. AMPHIS can be extended to any number of input parameters. For example, uh, instead of a one-dimensional function, we can approximate a two-dimensional function, a function of two variables. Here, for example, I have approximated uh, the static fault dislocation from SIV in one uh, benchmark example, using only four uh, discretization membership functions. Um, I approximated the two uh, slip function, uh, and you can see that after some epochs, uh, the basis function arrive at a stationary point. And uh, what we did here is simply to reduce the number of 
uh, basis function. We, instead of lots of uh, elements to, instead of lots of soft faults, used only four number of basis functions at each direction. We can use this approximation procedure to approximate the seismic data. Uh, consider this is one of the basis functions, the fuzzy basis functions in the problem that can be inserted into representation theorem and integrated over the Gaussian points uh, that can be using the Gaussian quadrature method, we can uh, approximate a representation theorem. We can uh, integrate these basis functions over them and make a, a matrix equation that can uh, transfer the source function into the seismic data. It makes an algebraic uh, multiplication that uh, the integration of each basis function times the amplitude of fuzzy basis functions gives us the data, the, the seismic data. Consider here that uh, the seismic data at each frequency and the integration of Gaussian uh, Green's function over the uh, fuzzy basis functions um, makes complex numbers. This is a complex number uh, matrix equation that can um, represent both the phase information and the amplitude information and uh, it can preserve the, the time, special time, special time uh, properties of the uh, source function. The hybrid training me method could be extended as well to find these parameters. Uh, at the first step, we can use the least square procedure to find the amplitudes and at the second step, we can use the steepest descent to find the parameters that describing the fuzzy basis function. And uh, by uh, taking this procedure many times uh, throughout the learning epochs, we can arrive at uh, parameters that describing the source function. But there is a problem here. This is a good approximation method, but uh, in in the framework of an inverse problem, we can easily overfit to the noise. And this is because that the problem has the, uh, is a Fredholm integral equation of the first kind, and it has very uh, small singular values. And when we do not constrain it without any regularizing uh, constraint, it can easily fit to uh, every out layers in the data. The classical procedure is to use an augmented cost function. By augmentation, a term by adding up a regularizing term to the cost function we are solving, uh, we can uh, obtain the, the source functions that is regularized and it prevents to uh, fit to the noise uh, in the data. Uh, here, the L I uh, represented is a smoothing operator. You all know this operator. And it's common in the kinematic finite fault inversion to use NABLA2 as the constraining operator. Uh, we are not restricted to this uh, regularizing operator. It is so common to use. But uh, it has no information from the physics of rupture. Uh, and we can um, use it for each frequency independently. We can assign a regularizing parameter that is specific to the frequency that we are finding. But there is a big problem here that how to determine alpha. Alpha, the regularizing parameter, could be obtained from various methods. Um, among them, we are proposing to use L curves. Uh, uh, by L curves, we can um, search for the alpha. We, we can test various number of alpha under, over the range of singular values of the problem and testing each one and making and plotting the L curve and finding the point that has the maximum curvature and taking that regularizing parameter and put it into the cost function and sending the cost function to the network to optimize the parameters. Note that both of these terms 
the data fit term and the regularizing term are function of the same parameters. Both of them are functions of the uh, nonlinear parameters of the fuzzy basis function and the linear parameters of the amplitudes of the fuzzy basis functions. The extension of the, uh, by far we showed that um, the Esli function was only has a one uh, component, one, one component vector. It was only in the strike sleep component, but it can be easily uh, extended to a deeper sleep by adding another uh, columns to the forward formula to represent to the deep sleep component and transferring them to data. Uh, this form can be easily replaced in the augmented uh, cost function that is uh, that represents the regularized problem and makes uh, the cost function that we use in the regularized form. Uh, the, the extension to a strike and deep sleep is uh, quite a straightforward and uh, the, the idea preserves its novelty. What we do have here is that uh, each of the terms that I represented in the last slide could be approximated with different meshes and different uh, integration methods. For the first thing that approximates the data feed, we can use uh, the in integration mesh uh, plotted here in blue, and we can use any desired function uh, integration, numerical integration method, for example, the Gaussian integration method. And uh, for, for the regularizing mesh, we can use another specific uh, mesh. For example, we can uh, put very dense points here, and they are isolated from the fuzzy basis that we are using to approximate the SLI function. We can increase um, the, the accuracy of the forward integration, and we can uh, apply a very uh, a higher strength uh, regularizing uh, constraint without changing the number of fuzzy basis functions. And there is a segregation between um, the, the approximation basis and the approximation, the, the quadrature method used for approximating the data. Here is an example of finding uh, the source function of the SIV in one example using only four by four uh, basis functions. You can see here that uh, after some training epochs, the the, the basis functions arrive at a stationary point, but it shows a rather a smooth uh, source function. Not all details of uh, the sleep rate function at zero hertz was obtained here, but it looks fair. And uh, it shows the key properties that we are searching for. It was our aim to reduce the number of basis functions and uh, finding a proper approximation of the source function. For a broad range of frequency, I present here the source function uh, at the zero hertz. Uh, in this example, I use six basis function at each direction. Uh, at the strike uh, component, six membership functions are used and at the deep direction, uh, six other basis functions are used. You can see it's not sensitive to the number too much. And uh, the six by six discretizations is not much different by four by four discretization. But at higher frequencies, um, if we are going beyond to higher frequencies, we can see the details of the SIV in one benchmark exercise increases and still at lower frequencies, the fuzzy inversion method is able to uh, retrieve key properties. But by increasing the frequency, I, I, our ability to resolve 
the details reduces. By inverse Fourier transform, we can easily obtain uh, the, the time domain escape rates. And uh, uh, you can see here that uh, the blue line shows the sleep rates obtained um, by the fuzzy approximation. And the black line represents the true SIV in one uh, sleep rate functions. It seems that the key properties are obtained, but you know that we are restricted to very low frequencies and uh, reducing the number of basis functions reduces our ability to arrive all of the small scale uh, variations of the uh, sleep function. The data fit is also well. It shows the key parameters, the key uh, properties of the, the, the seismic observations. And uh, it seems successful in this regard. What we see here is that by reducing the number of basis functions, we have only large singular values. When we are using only four by four in the A uh, sub figure here, uh, we are using only four by four basis functions. We have a low number of small singular values. By increasing the basis functions, the, the small singular values continuously increases. And uh, when we, are, we don't know anything about the noise in the data, it's better to use the low number, of, low number as possible. Um, in some slides later in the application to Amatrich earthquake, I will present a method that we can use to uh, determine the number of basis functions. Okay, let's turn into the Amatrice earthquake. The Amatrice earthquake is one of the best recorded earthquakes during uh, the recent years. And uh, we have lots of observations for this earthquake. For example, uh, at the strong motion uh, data set, we have uh, 20 stations very close to the fault plane, uh, below 50 kilometer. We use this strong motion data to constrain the high frequency range. Uh, we have also a static GNSS data and higher GNSS data. Uh, that can be used for a specific frequencies, for example, at zero hertz, we can use uh, the static GPS data and for uh, very low frequencies, we can use the higher GPS data. There is a big question that how to determine uh, the number of fuzzy discretization. We propose two uh, approaches to determine the number of basis functions. Uh, one approach is to formulate the problem using a formally overdetermined. By formally overdetermination, uh, we choose the number of observations. We, we, we choose the number of basis functions by simply taking the number of observations higher than the number of unknowns. For example, in this uh, case, for high frequencies in the, in the range of uh, assigned motion data that we had 20 stations, uh, we have 60 components. One of the components for RQT uh, station is missed, and we have 59 observations within each frequency. Uh, if we consider the number of uh, unknown amplitudes that we have uh, two uh, a strike and deep comp sleep components, each one has NKC, that is the number of basis function along the strike, and N eta, uh, that is the number of discretization along deep. Uh, we can determine the number of this discretization in a way that it forms a formally overdetermined problem for us. 
uh, if we take, for example, the six uh, discretization along uh, the strike and the four along the deep, we will have 59 uh, observations greater than 48 basis functions. And then we can obtain a formally over the term problem. Another method that is uh, uh, that we tested and it is uh, it can give us a good uh, criteria for selecting the number of basis function is the maximum likelihood approach. By maximum likelihood approach, we can uh, take the residual norm. Uh, we can simulate the problem with a broad range of basis functions. We, for example, from very low number of basis functions to very high number of basis functions uh, and see how the residual norm changes. The residual norm uh, obtained from the L curve can be assumed as the amount of uh, noise that is not very well fitted to the data. And we can make the histograms of that residual norms, taking the beam that has uh, the most number of the residual norms as the two one, as the maximum likely beam, and selecting the number of uh, basis functions, the lower number of basis functions that produces the, the most likely residual norm for us. This procedure has the both advantages of uh, reducing the number of basis function and maximi maximizing the likelihood of the error in the problem. We solved this, two, this problem, the problem of uh, finding a slip rates of a matrix earthquake using both procedures. Um, the, the left column shows the overdetermined procedure and the right column shows the maximum likelihood procedure. They are not much different in low frequencies and both methods gives us a similar uh, source function within different frequencies. But at higher frequencies, um, the, the difference arises. Uh, for frequencies above 0.25, uh, there, there are small changes uh, arise and it increases by increasing frequency. And this is our observation of the complexity of solving uh, the high frequencies. We can test the, the, the suitability, the, the preparedness of the in our inversion method using by testing uh, the data, the, the synthetic data on uh, independent observations. Uh, I told in a few list, uh, slides ago that uh, we inverted the source function using uh, the, the strong motion data. But we can test uh, the synthetics uh, by taking uh, the independent high rate GPS data. Uh, we did not use this high rate GPS data in the inversion. We only used the uh, strong motion data in the inversion. And uh, we simulate uh, the traces on high rate GPS data stations to see whether if they are able to uh, retrieve the key features, it seems that it was successful at. Uh, at simulating the key features of the seismic traces of high rate GPS data uh, at closer stations to the epicenter. But at far stations, there is a still some, uh, it seems that there is a still some information that is not very well resolved. But the method is overally successful at uh, reconstructing the properties of the independent observations of high rate GPS data. If we take the, the inverse Fourier transform to find the slip rate functions, uh, we can see that uh, the, the, the slip rate functions by the maximum likelihood approach is obtained by the black line. 
and the sleep rate functions uh, by the overdetermined is represented by the dashed line. The overdetermined uh, method shows a higher fluctuated, it is rather uh, oscillatory than the maximum likelihood approach. It seems that uh, the, the high frequencies obtained by the maximum likelihood approach is more consistent with lower frequencies. And uh, we take this uh, maximum likelihood obtained sleep rates to estimate the rise time parameters and the rupture arrival time, rupture, rupture onset times. But since there is an oscillatory uh, nature of, in the uh, sleep rates, I, I told that uh, we have difficulty in inverting the high frequencies. For a good reconstruction of the sleep rates and to finding a very well approximation of the onset time and rise time, we need to invert the high frequencies properly. But uh, we see that we have many problems with high frequencies. We are, we are proposing using a thresholding method. Uh, we are setting a threshold over the whole fault plane and uh, taking uh, the time that uh, the sleep rate uh, goes above this threshold. And uh, when it uh, goes above, we assume it as the rupture onset time. And when it decreases, the, the time span that is, uh, it is above this threshold value uh, is assumed as the rise time. Uh, this is not an accurate procedure, but it can give us a, a sense about uh, the properties of the uh, fault rupture. We can see where was the uh, stress release var, was a slower and which were on the fault plane, we had faster stress release. But for a, a more accurate representation, we need to uh, invert for high, higher frequencies. This is the sleep that we found for uh, the Amatrice earthquake. And uh, you can see here that the rupture is uh, starts from very shallow depths and it uh, spreads bilaterally. And we have a higher, a, a bigger uh, a sleep patch to the northwest, to the northwest of the fault plane. Uh, this property was very well addressed by other previous uh, studies. Uh, our solution has very uh, close spatiotemporal properties with PZ uh, solution that is that they use the linear inverse procedure proposed by Galovich. Um, there are two very well known uh, dynamic inversions uh, for this earthquake also presented in the literature. Uh, this one is presented by Galovich. We see that in the dynamic inversion they presented, they have a, a slower uh, fault rupture velocity which it seems uh, because of a trade-off between the, the sleep rate amplitude and the rupture velocity. Uh, we can uh, take both a very low and um, very high amplitude sleep rates and very low rupture velocity to give us uh, the similar uh, ground motion. Um, we see that the the rupture speed that Auchi and Tuarzik uh, found is most similar with our study. Uh, and uh, we have a, a lower resolution with respect to PZ et al. Okay. Let's jump into the reach crest sequence. Uh, the reach crest sequence is a similar earthquake that is uh, happened in 2019. Uh, uh, this earthquake has also very well uh, recordings and, and openly available data. Uh, 
uh, two earthquakes of rich, in the rich crest area happened within 34 hours. And uh, the first one was happened in this small fault. Uh, two faults were was, uh, ruptured in the same event at the first earthquake. And after 34 hours, uh, a bigger earthquake with magnitude 7.1 was happened on this curved line fault. And uh, we, we use the same procedure to obtain the sleep rate functions of the uh, rich curve sequence. Uh, we have 18 uh, strong motions uh, stations in a closed distance of the fault plane. Uh, we use it for to obtaining the higher frequency range uh, for uh, very low frequencies, we use the high rate and static GNSS data. And uh, for zero frequency, we use the static GNSS information. The data are obtained from UNAFCO and Southern California Earthquake Data Center. Please consider that when we have a curved fault plane, over fuzzy subfaults is a uh, could also be assigned to this curvilinear uh, coordinates. Uh, we can easily uh, transfer this uh, cur curvilinear fault plane into a planar fault and assign our, our fuzzy discretization and uh, then obtaining the membership to each points on the fault plane and making the fuzzy basis functions. Uh, the extension is a straightforward. Uh, I uh, and uh, we can use a still both of the discretization procedures I, I explained in the last in the few slides ago. For the M64 rupture, uh, we obtained this type of slip rate functions. Uh, this a small line uh, fault was uh, very loosely contribute, but we have a rupture here that uh, comes from very uh, deep points to the surface. And uh, we can see here that the whole rupture time was something about seven seconds. For the M7.1, uh, we obtained this fault rupture and uh, you can see that uh, we have very elongated sleep uh, distribution on the fault plane and the rupture propagates from the north uh, west to the southeast. And it takes about 20 seconds to hold rupture procedure uh, finishes. Uh, the, the perpendicular fault plane here it looks like it works something like a, an sleep barrier. And the sleep stops uh, by when it's interfering with the perpendicular fault. And uh, after some seconds, it ruptures the, the segment that is beyond this perpendicular sleep. Okay, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm very pleased for your questions and you can find out our preprints here. I will share the links of preprints with you in the chat and thank you for your attention. I'm ready for your questions. <laughs>